Um, my name is Flora Lichtman. I work for a science talk radio show that's broadcast on NPR. And where else would you find a science talk radio show, right? Um, and maybe I'll start with a poll. How many people here have heard of Science Friday? All right. That's great. All right. Um, for people who haven't heard of it, it's two hours a week talk radio. We've got about 3 million listeners across the country, 300 member stations, half a million podcast downloads, and my favorite bragging right um, is that we've been on the air for 21 years. Now, of course, I say we, but I was eight years old when uh, this guy, Ira Flato, started the show. He's the host of the program. And um, he's been sitting in the studio every Friday from 2 to 4 p.m doing Science Friday for two decades, which is amazing. Uh, I was hired about six years ago to take what we do on the radio and turn it into a web product, basically, to come up with some analog for the web. And what that has evolved into over the years is making a new science video every week and then chatting about it on the air. And this is sort of what it sounds like. With us here now is Flora Lickman and our video pick of the week. Hi, Flora. Hi, Ira. What you got for us this week? This week, we are taking a look at the secret speed demons of the animal kingdom. Forget, you know, forget the cheetahs. Oh, that was immediately what comes Me to too. mind, right? I cheetahs. think speed demons, I think cheetah, I think gazelle. Sure. Something. No. No. Microfauna. My favorite. <laughs> <laughs> so occasionally, we even include some information. But as you can see, one of the... <laughs> The main criteria for doing this job is just you have to be excellent at chit-chat. Um, so that's one of the things I have to do. But uh, another skill set you really need is to be able to take um, scientific information, information from scientists, and turn it into something that anyone can understand. And if you've talked to scientists, you may have noticed that sometimes they speak in a technical language. <laughs> Um, and, you know, the, the thing is that I come by this naturally because I grew up hearing a lot of nerds spoken around the house. I mean, my dad speaks English, um, but he is more comfortable in nerd, I would say. Um, so I don't, I'm not fluent in lingua nerda, but um, I'm okay in nerdlish. I'm really, like, playing this joke to the bone. <laughs> I know. Um, and it turns out that NPR listeners are even better in nerdlish than I am. But... The interesting thing to me is that this isn't actually the hard part of the job. If you don't mind sounding like a moron in interviews all the time, um, you can pretty much figure out what people are talking about. That's not a big deal. And uh, often scientists are really excellent at describing their work. But the hard part is figuring out not how to make it comprehensible, but to make people want to comprehend it. That is, it shouldn't just be digestible. It should be delicious for your brain. So the question is, how do you take sometimes esoteric, abstract information and make it appetizing? And I realized that um, as I was looking back at my videos, and I've done hundreds <laughs> at this point, that I use the same tricks over and over and over again. And they're kind of actually a little bit obvious, but this is what I want to share with you today. Uh, so the first recipe that I use all the time um, is I just go to the NPR standby, The Puzzler. Um, life, apparently, is even more mysterious than I knew, because every time I talk to a scientist, I learn about a new mystery. And I just want to give you an example of a couple of the videos I've done in the past couple of years that employ this technique. Bicycles are beautiful, like the stars are beautiful. And one likes to stare at the stars and wonder how they work. And we like to stare at bicycles and wonder how they work. You know, when you stare at a flame, you, you kind of can't help but wonder, what the heck is that thing? <laughs> there are different ways of getting water in. It's kind of fascinating. And any time I look at any insect, it's doing something that I couldn't even begin to design a robot or a machine to do. And the insect is doing it faster, easier, more precisely, and more accurately than I can imagine. So who knew? I mean, how dogs lap? There's a mystery there. I mean, this is a foolproof recipe because there's never a shortage of mysteries. It's not like I've ever talked to a researcher and that person has said, oh yeah, case closed. No more questions here. No, of course. You just drill down a little farther and there's a new fascinating question to uncover. So that's a good one. The next one is kind of cheap. Um, 
because I sort of skip science in this one and just go to humans. People like people. And, and one of the things that we've done at Science Friday that I'm most proud of is this new series called Desktop Diaries. My name is Oliver Sacks. Hi, I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson. Edward O, middle initial, Wilson. And this is my desk. And this is my desk. So what follows is uh, an interview based on people's desk trinkets. And amazingly, if you ask people about what they have in their office, you find out some really cool things. Like, for instance, we talked to E.O. Wilson a few weeks ago, and he has a Darwin bobblehead on his desk, and he apparently consults this bobblehead when he feels like he needs some moral support. <laughs> do, you, do you agree with my new theory? And he pops the bobblehead, and it's, it was a very charming moment. And a little insight into this person that I think many of our listeners so deeply admire. So the, the last recipe um, is a little bit, it's slightly more subtle. I think it's probably the most interesting and it definitely reveals my bias. Um, I think video is the best way to rope people into science. And that's because as technology, as video technology has gotten cheaper, more and more scientists seem to be using video, high-speed video, to collect data. And when they collect data in this way, the way they analyze it usually is with tools we all have, their eyes and their minds. So what you can do effectively is give the public access to the, the joy of discovery which I think is what is so alluring to most of the researchers I talk to. I mean, this is, this is basically, the, the analog is, is like saying, here's uh, an Excel spreadsheet, slap a regression on that, your, your mind's gonna be blown. It's very hard to get people to do that. It's not so difficult to get people to spend 30 seconds looking at something where it's immediately obvious that their, their mind is being blown. And, and I wanna give you an example of this recently from the show. This is not my footage, this is from Roger Hanlon, who's a marine biologist at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and he studies uh, cephalopods. I have to admit I was screaming when I got this video thing. What makes a marine biologist scream? <laughs> Roger Hanlon captured this about 10 years ago. He was doing a study in the Caribbean and he'd been following this octopus for about an hour. When it crept behind the rock and went into camouflage mode, he jammed the camera down right in its face, so to speak, prompting it to go from camouflage to a startle defense. Blanching white very quickly and then inking him. But I followed the animal and finished the dive, and I popped at the surface. It was only about five feet deep, and I screamed bloody murder, and they thought I was having a dive accident. When actually he was having... It was a eureka moment. There's no doubt about it. And the great thing about science video is that you can have that eureka moment, too. Um, that's all I got. <laughs> Hopefully I didn't... <laughs>